you please turn in your Bibles to Revelation 19, and we'll read from verse 11 to 16. Revelation 19, verse 11 to 16. Yesterday and Christmas morning, we looked at just verse 11 in a, in a simple manner. Today, we look at the, the longer text. Remembering, as I said yesterday, that this is visionary, symbolic language. It is the style of Revelation, the apocalyptic style. And it makes, uh, it makes for easier reading when we remember that. When we remember that these are truths that are being portrayed, picturized for us. It is a picture book, not a puzzle book. Verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's pray. King of kings and Lord of lords, faithful and true word of God, we declare your greatness, we proclaim your majesty, and we ask for your help as we sit under your word. Amen. At the risk of turning there one time too many, but in the third book of The Lord of the Rings, There is a scene in which the long-departed king of Gondor, Aragorn, finally returns to his people. Allow me to read to you some of the excerpts of how this unfolds. All things were now made ready in the city, and there was a great concourse of people, for the tidings had gone out into all parts, and all that could made haste to come. And the city was filled again with women and fair children that returned to their homes laden with flowers. All night lights were burning as men watched for the dawn. And when the sun rose in the clear morning above the mountains in the east, upon which shadows lay no more, then all the bells rang and all the banners broke and flowed in the wind, and upon the citadel the standard of the stewards being argent, being argent like snow in the sun, bearing no change nor device, was raised over Gondor for the last time. Now the captains of the west led their host towards the city, and folks saw them advance in line upon line, flashing and glinting in the sunrise and rippling like silver. And so they came, and upon either side of the gate was a great press of fair people in raiment of many colors and garlands of flowers. A hush fell upon all, as out from the host stepped Lord Aragorn. He was clad in black mail girt with silver, and he wore a long mantle of pure white, clasped at the throat with a great, green, great jewel of green that shone from afar. But his head was bare, save for a star upon his forehead bound by a slender fillet of silver. With him were Eomer of Rohan, and Prince Imrahil, and Gandalf robed all in white, and four small figures that many men marvel to see, small, but they are valiant. Now he is a marvel, the Lord King. Not too soft in his speech, mind you, but he has a golden heart. Here is Aragorn, son of Arathorn, 
chieftain of the Dunedain of Arnor, captain of the host of the west, bearer of the star of the north, wielder of the sword reforged, victorious in battle. Aragorn took the crown and held it up and said, In this place I will abide and my heirs. Ancient of days he seemed, and yet in the flower of manhood, and wisdom sat upon his brow, and strength and healing were in his hands, and a light was about him. And then Faramir cried, Behold the king! And in that moment all the trumpets were blown, and the king went forth. And amid the music of harp and viol and flute and the singing of clear voices, the king passed through the flower-laden streets and came to the citadel and entered in. And the banner of the tree and the stars was unfolded upon the topmost tower, and the reign of King Elisar began, of which many songs have told. The city was made more fair than it had ever been, even in the, first day, the days of its first glory. And it was filled with trees and with fountains, and its gates were wrought with mithril and steel, and its streets were paved with white marble, and the folk of the mountain labored in it, and the folk of the wood rejoiced to come there, and all was healed and made good, and the houses were filled with men and women and the laughter of children, and no window was blind, nor any courtyard empty, and embassies came from many lands and peoples. And there were brought before him many to receive his praise and reward for their valor, to be judged, and perceiving the mercy of the king, were glad and kneeling kissed his hand and departed in joy and content. Now I am in no way suggesting that forms a direct parallel to the book of Revelation. It would quickly break down if you push this too far. Tolkien's book is just fiction, not intended to be allegory. But for the sake of illustration, it does bear some similarity, doesn't it, to the inspired writings of John in the book of Revelation. We see the arrival of a highly honored, battle-proven, returning king with his army, the path of whose return meant facing and defeating his enemies and rescuing those whom he called his friends, and the consequence of whose return is judgment and reward and widespread joy among the peoples who serve him. Only now in these last chapters of Revelation, we see the real king. We see the infinitely great king. We see the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not for the first time in this book, is it? Because remember how we've been seeing this spinning up in different visions, things that illustrate the same things. The second coming has already been seen in chapter 6 and chapter 11 and chapter 14. Not different events lined up in sequence, but the same event visualized several times over from multiple different angles. And I've, as I've said to you before, as Revelation progresses, the intensity of the book amplifies. And in these verses, we now start with a portrait, a picture of what this returning king is like. Heaven is open to us, verse 11, uh, like the temple was, open, was seen in heaven in chapter 11, and like the, ta the tabernacle was seen in heaven in, in chapter 15. Once again, heaven is being opened, and we're being allowed to see something that was hidden. It is being revealed to us. And the first thing we see is the appearance of the returning king. Uh, many, it seems, break down this passage in a very similar fashion, looking at his appearance and then looking at his names and then looking at the manner of his return. That's what I'm going to do likewise. Uh, others have done it. I'm doing the same. The appearance of the returning king. And there comes now this portrait, this, this picture painted with words, and it has the same apocalyptically styled language that we've had all along and come to expect. This is not a literal des description of Jesus' physical features. It, it is symbolic. It's, it's less like photography and more like poetry. And firstly, verse 11, we see is behold upon a white horse. And as I said yesterday at the Christmas service, uh, the one riding this horse is, of course, Jesus Christ. This is not the same white horse as the one in chapter 6. It's the same imagery of a white horse, uh, the white horse being a picture of military conquest in triumph. But where is chapter 6? It is an image that is used to describe generally all warfare upon the earth, describing judgments upon the earth. Here in chapter 19, the image is being used very specifically of Christ's own victory in his return. He is coming as the conquering king. Then note verse 12, his eyes are like a flame of fire. 
Exactly the same imagery that we find in chapter 1 in the vision of Christ. Fire being that constant picture of the Lord's holiness and purity and judgment. He appears as fire to Moses in Exodus 3. His eyes are like torches of fire, says Daniel 10. Uh, he is call, he's called a consuming fire in Hebrews 10. The throne is fiery flames, says Daniel 7. And the fact that it is now his eyes that are like fire is very telling. They are eyes that burn their way through every illusion, every facade, every act, every hypocrisy, every mask that people might wear. They pierce to the very center of a person, discerning all, knowing all, and nothing is hidden from his sight. No thought, action, attitude, word, or motive. I mean, often I've had people say to me, and other preachers will say the same thing, They've had people come to them and say, you know, during the preaching, I thought you were talking about me. Or even, you know, that sermon was so close to home, I was worried that my husband or wife might think I had shared something with you behind, my, uh, behind their back. <laughs> when the sermon just seems so cuttingly close to your circumstances for, uh, out of encouragement or conviction. Why does that happen? It is because the Word of God is so intensely penetrating. It's a truth that cuts and divides and exposes as the Holy Spirit applies it. This is what Hebrews 4 talks about. Now, if God can do that with the preached Word through weak, fallible human preachers with all of our shortcomings, if he can with such frightening specificity expose our sins through human preachers, what will be the effect of the return of Christ himself when he comes with eyes blazing like fire? He knows everything. Then on his head are many diadems, many crowns. And again, let's not think of some cartoon caricature here, balancing these crowns. Uh, the, the word for crown here is, is meaning a political one. It's not an athletic crown of victory. But these crowns symbolize his dominion, his reign, his authority over many empires, nations, kingdoms. You, you may remember how the beast, the Antichrist, tried to counterfeit this in chapter 13, having ten diadems, symbolic of the temporary influence of Satan over the world's nations, a government, ten diadems he had. But in Christ's return, there's this picture of his total authority and his dominion over all things. You may also remember in Matthew chapter 4 how Satan sought to tempt Jesus by offering up all the kingdoms of the world and their glory without him having to face the cross. And Jesus refused, of course. But now we see Christ receives all the kingdoms of the world and all the glory because of the cross. As Philippians 2 says, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him a name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is on earth and in heaven. Because of the cross. Because of the cross. He wears many crowns, our Lord. And every secular Western president and prime minister and parliament, and every tyrannical dictator, and every sultan and every prince, and everyone in their domains will fall before him who wears the many diadems. Then verse 13 he is clothed in a robe, dipped, baptized in blood. An extremely graphic picture of the king returning, drenched in the lifeblood of his enemies. Some Christians like to argue, well, maybe this is Christ's own blood, alluding to the blood of the cross, because he gave up his blood, his life, to save his people. But far more likely, given the context, that this is the blood of of those who opposed him. Listen to the background to this passage from Isaiah 63. We read 62 earlier on. Isaiah 63, it has a bit of a, a Q&A, a question and an answer, a second question and a longer answer. Listen to what it says there. Who is this 
who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Bosra, he who was splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. Answer, it is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Question, why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? Yeah, why, why are they scarlet? Why are they crimson? Why are they splattered in this way? Answer, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splattered on my garments and stained all my apparel, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. And did you hear? Why is the returning king covered in blood? Because as verse 15 of Revelation says here, he presses the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Which tells you that the return of this Christ will not be good for all people without exception, but only those whom he has redeemed, who, who his arm has brought his salvation. That is Christian. For every other person on the planet, every other person, his return will mean their eternal conscious ruin. Verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. Again, recalling the servant prophecy from Isaiah 49.2, he made my mouth like a sharp sword. And again, please don't think of this like a photo. Jesus will not be returning looking like some sort of monstrosity. Take the meaning of the symbolism. Sword in this ancient context meant war and it meant justice. And coming from his mouth, it shows that this just war will be with the ease of a spoken command. There will be no great effort on Christ's part to marshal his divisions, set supply lines, prepare ammunition and fuel depots, plan and strategize, and allow for unexpected contingencies. None of that is necessary. As with creation, so it will be with decreation. He will just speak, and the end will come. You can see, this is not the Jesus of some of modern Western evangel evangelicalism, uh, there is a sword coming from his mouth, not rose petals and cotton candy. Isaiah 11 verse 4, He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. So, so that's the appearance given to this returning king. Secondly, look at the names and titles he bears four of which are mentioned or alluded to here. Firstly, he is called faithful and true, verse 11. Jesus was the faithful witness in chapter 1, again the faithful and true witness in chapter 3, and now we see that Christ is faithful, faithful to himself, his word, his promises, his covenant, and faithful to those in them. He's also faithful to execute justice against those who refuse him. And Christ is true which in the Hebrew mind carried the same idea as faithful, true to himself, true to his word, true to his covenants, while also declaring to us that he is the source and standard of absolute truth and morality, faithful and true. Only whereas before Christ bore witness to these things in his life and death and resurrection and through the ongoing witness of the church, through our uh, um, evangelism, through our proclamation and warning of the world, now, the season of bearing witness and testimony is at an end. Now he comes to bring com to completion everything that he previously spoke of. He is just called faithful and true. Lesser judgments from history will now reach their climax, and the work of salvation begun in history will reach its consummation, because Jesus is faithful and true. And this is something that suffering Christians need to be reminded of, including the first recipients of this letter, including Christians in India that we were praying for earlier in the service, we need to remember that Christ is faithful and true. 
Secondly, though, note that the one sitting on the white horse has a name written that no one knows but himself, verse 12. And again, this produces some interesting discussion amongst Christians. We, we know the names of God always communicate who He is. They tell us about Him. So some will say that this name of verse 12 will never be known because we simply do not have the capacity to grasp the infinite depths of God. Uh, that, that much is true. We, we cannot fully comprehend the greatness of God. He is infinite. He is eternal. Then others will say, well, that this name, which is unknown in verse 12, is immediately revealed and known in verse 13. The name by which he is called is the Word of God, therefore removing the mystery. Still others will say that the name which is presently unknown will eventually be known. Because in chapter 2, 17 and 3, verse 13, both speak of a new name, the new name of God to be written upon the Christian if they persevere to the end, making this a promise of a new and more wonderful appreciation of the goodness and godness of God and the glory of God in the ages to come. Because remember, to, to know His name is more than just to have an intellectual cognition of His name and be able to write it down. It is to actually be in relationship with Him, to know Him in that sense, know who He is and, and be known in that intimate way. And this fits the background of Isaiah chapter 62 through 65 pretty well. Where in the context of the appearance of the Messiah, there is the trampling of his enemies on the winepress. There is a marriage, a wedding supper between Jehovah and true Israel. And there is given to the true spiritual Israel, to the church, a new name. Something that began at the betrothal with the first coming of Christ. New status, new relationship, new knowledge of God but which is only consummated at His second coming, the return of the King, uh, with a new and intensified level of knowing God, such as has never before been experienced by the church. So a beautiful picture there of, of the, the heightened experience and knowledge of God in the ages to come. Thirdly, though, the one sitting on the white is called by the name the Word of God, verse 13. Remember John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It is a title that implies the unity of will and power and action, a title that means wisdom and eternality, and one which speaks of Jesus both then in John and now in Revelation. He is the Word. Uh, we, we sang it, Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. He, he is the revelation of God. Uh, well, John 1.18 speaks about he has, he has made Him fully known. In the person of Christ, God is made fully known. But what's interesting is that the phrase Word of God is used uh, four other times in the book of Revelation, and on each occasion it, it occurs in conjunction with the testimony or the testimony of Jesus. In other words, as someone has said, the Word of God is most fully revealed in the life and acts and teachings of Jesus Christ. Jesus embodies the Word of God because He is the Word, He lived the Word, He obeyed the Word, He gave the Word, and He bears now this title. If you missed that, to summarize and simplify, let me put it like this. The name Word of God here means that Jesus is the everlasting God, bringing to us the testimony of God, being Himself with the fullness of divine wisdom and power and accomplishing God's will. It's a statement of divinity. Absolute, total divinity. And fourth name there, the one sitting on the white horse has the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords, verse 16. Uh, the fact that this name is on his thigh and his robe is not saying it is written twice, but explaining its positioning um, on his thigh, that is, on the, on the robe along his thigh. That this, this, I'm told, is the, the sense of the Greek text there. It's written there horizontally on the, on the robe across the thigh so as to be seen by others as he rides into battle. It's a name that is also very easy to understand. I don't need to tell you what King of Kings and Lord of Lords means. And it's proof that John was not being coy with the message of Revelation. And sometimes you hear Christians 
explain the style of Revelation. They look at the apocalyptic, and they, they don't understand that this is actually a historical genre. And, and they, they're trying to explain away the style of Revelation with its pictorial language, saying that, well, you know, John was trying to keep things under the radar. He didn't want to rock the boat too much in the early Roman Empire. And they'll point to things like chapter 14 where it says, and they'll say, you know, 666, it's just like a secret clever code for Nero if you've got the wits to figure it out or something like that. Never mind that those number games can give you hundreds of names. Hundreds. Probably some of our names too, to distress you. (laughs) But here, as elsewhere in Revelation, is incontrovertible proof that the last thing on John's mind is secrecy. You cannot point to Jesus Christ riding in militaristic triumph, in conquest upon a white horse, ascribing to him titles like King of Kings and Lord of Lords in a direct and provocative challenge to the Roman emperors, and then say, well, Revelation is trying to be discreet. It's not. It's it's loud. This is as loud as words can possibly be. It's graphic, it's commanding, it's attention demanding, and it is entirely unashamed of what it is saying. Who is this Jesus Christ? He is the sovereign over and above all other sovereigns, the ruler of the kings of earth who ruined Pharaoh, who humbled Nebuchadnezzar, who destroyed Nero, who crushes every political adversary, ancient or modern, and who will cast the devil himself into the lake of fire. These are the titles that he bears. And thirdly and finally, the manner of his return. We've seen the portraits. We've seen the names and titles. But what is he doing? How how does he arrive upon this white horse? Verse 11, in righteousness he judges and makes war. He is righteous, holy, blameless, pure, and right in every respect. He judges in righteousness. He passes verdict, renders punishment in a manner that is altogether right and holy and pure and blameless. And so far-reaching will this be that it is described as a war against sinners. Not against Christians. Romans 5 verse 1, Since we have been justified with, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We, we have peace. The treaty was signed in the blood of the Son. You you are safe if if you know and love and follow and trust on the one who is called faithful and true, word of God, King of kings and Lord of lords. But the same cannot be said for everyone else with whom God will wage war. Then verse 14, the the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, are following him on white horses. This is the manner of his return. He arrives with, with the armies of heaven. He arrives with an entourage. And, and, and who are they? Some say angels. Some say Christians in glory or all Christians. And some say angels and the glorified church together. It actually doesn't change anything, whichever the answer is, as we'll see. But I suggest to you that this now is the church alone. Because these white robes are what, they are, 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 are what mark them, what identify them. White robes are what are promised to the church in Revelation 3, verse 4, 5, and 18, if they overcome. White robes are what are given to martyred Christians waiting for this day in Revelation 6, verse 11. White robes is what the great crowd of the redeemed wear in Revelation 7, verse 9, 11, and 14. So, so this seems to be the church and here are the multitudes of heaven gathered together and they themselves are given also white horses because they have conquered they have overcome as per the instruction given to every single one of these seven churches earlier in the letter god has faithfully given them the white robe and the white horse of triumph And now they are with Christ on the final day of His victory. You mean only those Christians that have died? No, I mean all the church. I mean you included. If the Lord returns in our lifetime, we will be quickly uh, assembled into this, this, this great army, this great host. 
This, this is not some linear time frame. This is a pictorial representation of the return of the king. The church will be with God when he executes final judgment on the earth. Only we will be dressed in white, pure and righteous, and riding white horses more than conquerors through him who loved us. Romans 8. Because of his victory. And notice again, what exactly will we be doing here as part of this host, this army? You know, are, are, we, are we sort of loading the cannons? Are we carrying the weapons? Are we you know, rolling up our sleeves to duel with demons? Is this great last battle to be waged by us? Is it our strength of arms that must prevail? Should we, the church, be lobbying the government to ally with certain countries in the Middle East? Is there some great end times crusade that the church must now enlist in? No. Look at the picture. We're not even wearing armor. We're not wearing camouflage. We're just following the king. Because he does everything. The victory is all his. The battle will be won by him. Only him. Without so much as the least contribution by me. By the church. Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. Verse 14. He will strike down the nations. Not they. Not we. But he. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And by the way, the word rule here isn't so much as govern or rule over in the sense of a functioning government where the nations carry on with their business and the king rules. This isn't speaking about the coexistence of beastly governments and Christ. The background to this is Psalm 2. The Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you, that great messianic psalm. The Lord said to me this, uh, you're my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. There's the rule. It is the ruling judgment. It is the rule of law bringing their destruction. The eternally begotten son, begotten, not created, the Messiah the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word become flesh, Jehovah, will break, dash, and shatter into pieces every one of his enemies as he casts them into the lake of fire. Verse 15, he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the Almighty, crushing sinners underfoot, letting the juices of rebel humanity flow and cover his robe trampling them in his anger, vengeance in his heart. These are the sentiments of Isaiah 63, not my own. You resist the urge to apologize for this portrayal of this vengeful king. We must not breeze past this part of the Bible. We must not hide these things from, from unbelievers. Let the Scriptures, perfectly inspired, recorded, preserved for us, let them do their job in creating fear in the hopes that they will also draw people to Christ. Because His army, His people, the church, will see this and praise Him for it. You will see this and you will praise Him. See Him splendid in His apparel, marching in the greatness of His strength. This is who we're waiting for. The arrival of a highly honored, battle-proven, returning king with His army of whom we are a part. One whose path included facing and defeating His enemies, and rescuing those with whom he is pleased to call friends. One who as a consequence of his return will render judgment, dispense reward, and create widespread joy along, among those who long for his appearing. One who will restore the city and make the land, the earth to be renewed, made more fair than it had ever been even in the days of its first glory. This is the returning king. 
Are you ready for his return? Now, I don't mean that as a warning or threat to all, to, to those of you who are not at peace with God through faith in the gospel. To you, I would offer that warning. Are you ready? But I mean, Christian, Christian, are you ready? Are you excited? Are you standing at the gate, garlands of flowers ready to be thrown? Are you, are you ready, waiting, watching as the watchman for the dawn? Are you looking forward to standing witness to the recreation of the whole world when by the simple spoken words of God, He decreates all that is and recreates the paradise that was lost? Do you want to see that? To see creation? Did, did, did you ever want to see the first creation? To see it just coming together, springing into, into existence, ex nihilo, out of nothing? You wish you could see a part of that. Well, you're going to see something better. You're going to see paradise restored. So are you ready? Are you looking forward to the day of His return? Are you preparing yourself? Washing away every spot and blemish? Are you calling to others? All who have ears to hear? All, all, all that would make haste to come to the city? He's coming back. Because He is faithful. And He is true. And he will be seen for what he is, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the hope this gives us to see our King return to know that this world with, with all of its struggles and trials and persecutions is not in its present state our home. That will be made anew and that we will see you. We will see the face of God. We thank you, O Lord, our God, for the hope this gives. And we pray that this year to come, if it is not the year of your return, if you should delay another hundred or thousand years, we pray that this year to come would be a year in which you gather many, that you plunder the kingdom of darkness and populate the kingdom of light. Use us if it please you, Lord. Stir us to, to, speak, to speak more often, to speak more clearly. Stir us to acts of evangelism. Stir us to boldness and witness and proclamation and make us to be effective in your service Lord for apart from you we can do nothing cause us to bear fruit as the spirit works within us sanctify us to your pleasure and for our good and glorify your name in the church we ask amen